All right. So, hey, again, nice job with the class challenge. I'll, I'll do that kind of thing in other ways, but basically getting you guys to try to come up with some stuff and dangling a couple bonus points in front of you uh, some other times this year. All right. So inverse functions. Honestly, it, I don't expect that that's where you would have started, but that's really where we should start. These are inverse functions. And just to kind of highlight what you guys said is always true about an inverse function. Excuse me, about two inverse functions. A lot of times the thing that kids notice visually is that idea of symmetry. Okay, now here's the thing. It's always y equals x. Again, I, I say, do you remember that? If you don't remember that, it's, it's always y equals x. Sometimes people are like, well, why? As you guys said, they're reflections, so that is true. But there's something algebraically going on with y equals x. Y equals x is kind of like the, the pivot line. And if we start to look at some things about the equations, you can start to see this. You can start to see that things switch. Things switch. The domain, the domain of that first function, look, it becomes the... Hold on a second here. Okay, so we'll have, we're going to have to make a little bit of a change here. But the domain of that first function, which I guess was the square root function, so uh, it was greater than 2, basically. That actually becomes the range of the other function. We're just going to make this little change. I'm not going to take away from what you guys did with your bonus. But just look. If you look at the square root graph, it's greater than 2 for the x value. If you look at the parabola, it's greater than 2 for the y value. And so we have like a switch going on. Okay, It's happening here also with the, the range. The range of the first one becomes the domain of the second one. What I'm getting at here is we have a switching. And these would be things that if you had said, wow, it would have been... Um, really over the top, but I want to make sure I say it. And we'll highlight this again on Monday, but there's always a switch of X and Y. There's a switch of X and Y. Now, if you're like, what do you mean there's a switch of X and Y? Look again. Look at what's going on with the points that you guys found, because the square root graph has two zero. But look, if you switch those numbers, you get zero two. So that's numerically what we mean by a switch of X and Y. By the way, every point, every point would be a switch. And then I want to show you what I mean algebraically with the equation. Okay, now you can watch this if you want. We're going to do another problem. But um, when you switch X and Y in this equation, and again, you might, you might say, yeah, I kind of remember doing that. You would have done it in algebra and maybe even trigonometry. If you switch X and Y, Okay, if you kind of like force that to happen, and then you solve this equation for y, so you get x squared equals y minus 2, otherwise known as x squared plus 2, well, look what you get. You get the other function. Okay, so you can switch x and y so you can get the inverse. Now, I'll, set, I'll share with you that one little detail, and nice job. As soon as Bryce put that comma there, I was like, all right, that little detail needs to be put onto this answer so that it's the true reflection. And the reason is because if you don't, you have too much parabola. If you did not put that comma there, then technically the whole parabola should be there. And everybody should look at that and say, yeah, those don't have symmetry. Okay, so this little caveat, okay, it's something we have to be careful about when we're doing an inverse problem. I'm just trying to think here. I feel like there's one more thing. Function composition. Function composition. And again, I, I'll be honest, I didn't expect you to find that unless you really dig in the book. But function composition cancels out to be X. 
when you have inverses. What, what do we mean by that? Let's do function composition for these two functions. Um, we'll take the g function and we'll plug it into the f function. So I'll call this the g function just because it's the second one. So we're going to take this function, we're going to plug it in, getting a little messy here, but we're going to plug it into the other function. We're going to do function composition. So look what happens when you do f of g. Looks like that x right there becomes x squared plus 2. I still have a minus 2. That's part of the square root function. Oop, minus 2 right there. And you can see, I mean, it's actually this is the way it's supposed to work. It's going to cancel out to be x. And that's also true when you have inverse functions. Okay, It's actually kind of a way that you can prove that you have them you can do composition and see what happens. Anything else? I heard a few people, how do you put this in your calculator? It's just kind of a little extra information. You don't need to be able to do this, but I like that you guys notice that. It's the calculator's way of typing in like a piecewise function or a piece of a function. You follow the, <clears throat> the, the function with a divided by sign. Yeah, that's actually a divided by sign. But as soon as you use this double parenthesis uh, notation, it interprets that divided by sign as basically a comma. And so you can then type in the restriction. That greater than sign, you know, if you're really interested, it's in the test menu. Some extra stuff that's not necessarily important, but it can do it. Let's do a problem from basically kind of start to finish. Just because I want you to leave feeling like, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. It's going to be what we just did. It's just going to be applying it, applying what we did. Or is that Hagamore chunk? Now, if you haven't maybe uh, switched to notes yet, in fact, let me, because I know that how students are, if I, uh, if I put it up here, it feels a little more like it's something you should know. But I'm just going to be putting up what we kind of talked about. And honestly, what you guys came up with. But let me, let me put this up because it kind of makes you feel like, okay, it's more important. Does it look familiar? It was neat to watch you guys kind of talk about this stuff. Of course, I added a little bit to it. And this is always true when you have inverses. And maybe it's good that I put this up because it reminded me also of one other piece here. Maybe you saw it in the book, this thing about one-to-one. -one. I heard actually somebody talk about the horizontal line test. Okay, let, let's talk about that real quick. It's kind of one of those little, this has to be true in order to have an inverse. So in order to have an inverse, the function's got to be one-to-one. And maybe you're saying, what is one-to-one? One-to-one -one means that you're not going to have any repeated y values. OK? 
Okay, so it'll pass the horizontal line test. These are algebra concepts. I, I have seen these on some college entrance exams, so I want to go over this because honestly, it's pretty easy once you hear what it is. But uh, you actually need to kind of test if the function is one to one before you get down and dirty and try to find the inverse. I actually want to do a problem that was similar to your class challenge because it's got it's got a step in it that you want to realize, okay, this is what we're talking about with one to one. So it's a square root. It also gives us an opportunity to talk about do you know how to graph it? Okay, when I say that I mean without a calculator. It doesn't hurt to hear it again because it helps you guys to remember the stuff you learned. Whenever you have a plus or minus sign beside x or maybe the teacher taught it that it's on the inside if i have a plus or minus sign on the inside that's a horizontal shift it's a horizontal shift as some people remember kind of opposite in other words the plus sign is going to actually make me shift to the left four that's really because negative four is the y or the x intercept it's better to think that it's the x intercept but it does appear to be the opposite. It's a square root graph. So same kind of graph that you guys saw up on the calculator. Now, look, the reason I sketched that was so that we could just kind of visually say it's one to one. It's one to one because if you start drawing horizontal lines or just picture horizontal lines, they only touch at one point. Okay, let's keep going because I want to come back to that. In other words, what happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if it's not one to one? But let's solve the problem so we can see what kind of answer we get here. The, the typical problem is going to be find the inverse um, and then maybe, you know, kind of like verify it. I, I think the book will often say verify. But let's find the inverse, as you saw me do for the other problem. It's actually just as simple as switching x and y. Okay, and it works this way every time. As soon as you switch x and y, you're kind of forcing all of this stuff to happen. You're forcing symmetry. You're forcing reflection. Okay, all the things that are part of the, our list up here. Okay, so, and then you solve for y. In other words, if, if you can write an equation as y equals, you do it. So I would expect that you're going to solve for y. You're going to square both sides. You get x squared. And then, of course, you subtract 4, and you get x squared minus 4. It's not meant to be too hard, but it's got a couple little details that we still need to fix, okay? Because yes, this is the inverse. Here's a little piece of notation. I guess we haven't really shown it yet, but you've seen this before. It stands for the inverse, f to the negative one. But again, there's like a little detail that needs to be fixed. And this is the kind of thing that when you guys take your test that I want you to be thinking about, okay? I'm not gonna pull out some really crazy function that uses logarithms or something and tell you to find the inverse. But what I'm going to expect you to do is understand that this answer is technically not right. Why? Think about your original function. Okay. You can already visualize the reflection. The reflection is going to be the switch of the points. Yeah, I could switch that and I can get zero negative four. The reflection is going to have symmetry. 
So you kind of have to be able to visually draw, but you know, if we're going to have symmetry, can you start to see how the shape is going to, I don't know if I want to say it goes the other way, but it, it's a reflection. Now the graph that I just drew there, that's the inverse. Sometimes in math, it's just the little details that we need to be aware of. And the little detail is that the graph that I just drew is not x squared minus 4. Okay? It's half of x squared minus 4. x squared minus 4 is a full parabola. Okay? So it's not like it's, it's the wrong answer. It just needs to be made to be right. It needs to be half of a parabola. So here we go again, putting on a restriction. Now, listen, listen, when you put this restriction down, there has to be a point that you realize, okay, why are we writing greater than or equal to zero? Okay, and the, the point or the reason that I want you to get to is because <clears throat> this is to the right of zero. It's just because the graph is to the right of zero. Okay, I can't point at another number up here and say, oh, it's that number. I'm actually using the graph, and it's to the right of zero. Now, students sometimes will say, well, how am I going to know? You have to graph it. Okay, You have to be thinking about the graph. All right, there's your inverse, all cleaned up. And like I said, I'm pretty sure the book will say verify. Now, we actually verified it visually, I mean, or graphically because the graph has symmetry. So, you know, that, that counts. We can also verify it algebraically. And that's referring to function composition. That's referring to the f of... Now, it actually would be f of f inverse. Can we change the letters a little bit instead of saying f of g? f of f inverse. So you take the inverse and you plug it in. You take the inverse and you plug it in, but you gotta show it. So we have our x plus four, but it's going to be replaced with x squared minus four. But there we go, we plugged it in, and you can see the kind of the same thing, canceling out to just be x. Now we we verify it. One to one, and then we'll be done. But one to one, just kind of want to. Sometimes students look at this, they're kind of like, what's the big deal about it? You know, is everything one-to-one? -one? What if it's not one-to-one? -one? Let's just have kind of a quick conversation. It's actually a different problem, but I'm going to create the problem just with a, a simple graph. Let's say your graph that you start with is a parabola. Now follow me here. I'm starting with the parabola. If you notice, that's kind of how, that's kind of been the answer to our problem. But now it's the original one. There's no reason we can't just visually do this. We don't have to make up numbers. Just want you to notice something. Okay. First off, is this guy one to one, just kind of like based on this little simple definition? Okay, it's you should be given a real simple no, it's not. But if you're like, what's the big deal? Okay, well, watch because this is not one to one. Here comes the inverse. Here comes the inverse. Now, what I just drew there is the visual inverse but it's got a problem. It's kind of like a math problem, but there's a problem with it. What is 
the problem with this graph that I drew. Again, it's like a mathematical problem. So technically, the inverse does not exist. Maybe we should say the inverse function does not exist. You say, but you drew it, but it's not a function. So if I start with something that's got a problem, I'm going to end with something that's got a problem. Again, it's a mathematical problem. Now, if you're like, so what would we do? Well, you know, if I honestly gave you a function that's not one to one, you would be able to say there's no inverse function. There's no inverse function. Okay, technically that means you wouldn't go through all this. Okay, technically you wouldn't have to verify it because technically there's no inverse in the first place. But again, it's because it's not a function. That's what the one-to-one -one thing is. All right, now we still have some stuff to do with section 1.5, that what we'll do Monday. Um, but I highly encourage you to be looking at section 1.3. It's not a bad little section. It has to do with exponential. Remember some things about the graph and some application. So get working on that because section 1.5, well, that'll, we'll be finished with that on Monday. All right, so...